Welcome to APRA's 15th Town Hall on COVID-19. My name is Billy Zydek, Standards and Codes Administrator for APA. Allow me to review a couple of housekeeping items before we start. All attendees are in listen-only mode. We ask that you utilize the chat box for the Q&A segment of this session. While we attempt to respond to all questions submitted, should we run out of time, responses will be posted to APA's COVID-19 RAQ Recently Asked Questions webpage. We also remind participants to ensure their speaker volume level is set for your comfort. Our speakers are gathering us from across the continent and as such, varying volumes will be present. Today's session will award professional continuing education credits as well as ISDs and AIA HSW CLU. For AIA certificates, please email me at Billy B-I-L-L-I-E at APA.org, along with your AIA membership number if you have not sent it to me previously. Our webinar recording will be posted to the APA website later this afternoon. Additionally, you will receive a follow-up email within 72 hours providing designated links to all webinar recordings, presentation slides, as well as information on upcoming webinars and town halls. At this time, it's my pleasure to introduce Lander Medlin, APA's Executive Vice President for your moderator today. Lander, take it away. Welcome all attendees. We appreciate your engagement in these town hall meetings as we further explore the impact of COVID-19 on our facilities organizations and the education enterprise. Our town halls occur every Friday with a different target and focus, hint, Next week's topic is Special Communities, Challenges and Strategies for K-12 School Districts, Preparatory Schools, Community Colleges, and Med-Ed. I would like to thank today's Town Hall sponsor, National Facewear, perfect timing, critically important, and you'll hear that later, what a great company, and thank you for doing this. A special thank you also to our two collaborating partner associations, AKUOI, through Mary De Niro, that's the Association of College and University Housing Officers International, and NASPA, the professional home for the field of student affairs through Kevin Kruger. Both my counterparts and two people I have known for a long time and are a real pleasure to work with. As always, thank you for joining the dialogue. Please post your questions at any time. That's what makes this a rich conversation and the special community we share. As institutions determine their path to a fall reopening, the whole student experience begins with arriving at their dorm, entering that dining hall, and their first walk to and through the student union. How will we orchestrate that engagement and movement safely? That's why we chose this topic today. Challenges for auxiliaries, dorms, dining, and unions. These three panelists will share their strategies, challenges, and questions concerning the complexity of our student auxiliary services and the task of delivering a consistent student experience across their campus spaces. So here's the format for today's town hall. I'll provide an introduction to set this week's context, introduce each panelist who will share their framing remarks, then proceed with Q&A from all of you. I'll conclude with a highlight of our professional development summer series and virtual facility summit, the new name for the annual meeting, call for images, available resources, save the date, and closing remarks. If you thought things were grim two weeks ago, it's actually worse, much worse. Ugh, the resurgence of COVID-19 cases have skyrocketed across 37 states, totaling 3.1 million in two weeks. That's up from 2 million one month ago. New cases exceeded their all-time daily record for consecutive days, topping 60,000 with 50% of those infections, 18 to 40 year olds. At this
not us, is in control. We continue to remain late in the game on testing and contact tracing capabilities. We're not even close. We should be testing five times the present number of 700,000 people per day. There is no doubt we must engage in social, physical distancing and wearing face coverings or masks. As for the economy, stocks are volatile amidst the soaring new COVID cases. And although we added 4.8 million jobs in June, last week we added another 1.4 million Americans who filed new claims for unemployment insurance. Higher education's face-to-face -face reopening plans may say yes. The virus may say no. It's already said no to Ivy League sports, now postponed at, until at least January. And the Big Ten just announced it will only play conference games. Still, there remains much preparation from campus auxiliaries, facilities, and the surrounding community. Hence, our panelists will share their reopening planning strategies, challenges, and questions as they engage in it delivering a consistent whole student experience for those returning to their dorms, dining halls, and student unions. As COVID has reshaped the way we go about our lives, the road to reopening takes leadership, collaboration, and an aligned culture, no matter the chosen path. Let's start with our first panelist, James Bridgeforth, Director of Housing, University of South Alabama. James has served as a housing professional for more than 15 years where he has worked to build a tradition of residence life on several campuses. His work experience includes serving in housing programs at liberal arts colleges, private religiously affiliated institutions, HBCUs, which is historically black colleges and universities, and large public universities. Dr. Bridgeforth is passionate about blending student development, operations, and diversity into a seamless housing program. James currently serves as the Akuho I Executive Board as the Facilities and Physical Environments Director, where he strives to increase diversity in housing, facilities, and operation. He has also served as the chair of their Case Management Task Force to expand best practices in mental health and case management for college students. James holds a Bachelor of Arts in Sociology from Catawba College, a Master's Degree in Higher Education Administration from the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and a Doctorate in Higher Education Administration and Institutional Research from the University of Southern Mississippi. James, let's hear the strategies you're deploying for your residential housing community, along with some practices others could adopt. James? So Billy, can you hear me? Unmuted. Lander, yes, Lander, yes. I can hear you. Okay, so we can't hear James, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, so he's there, but he is, um, James, we cannot hear you. Uh, so you might want to dial on in again.
For some reason, you are on mute. So what I'm going to do, since you all can hear me, is I'm going to move to our next panelist and then I'll come back to James. His name is, is Keith T. Kowalka. He's the Assistant Vice President for Student Affairs, University of Houston. Keith provides leadership, strategic vision, organization, and innovation for the development and delivery of programs, services, and facilities Focus it on focusing on learning and student engagement while enriching the campus life experience. Keith provides administrative oversight for numerous departments across the Student Affairs Auxiliary Portfolio. He chairs the UH Weeks of Welcome program and UH Homecoming Steering Committee and works with major campus events. He serves as the Student Affairs and Enrollment Services Liaison to the College of Education, Higher Education Program for Graduate Assistant and Graduate Intern Placement. Keith received a BA in Political Science and Management and a BA in Communication and Marketing from the University of Toledo, along with a master's degree in Guidance and Counseling with an emphasis on College Student Personnel Administration. Keith, let's get that sense of place with your student union along with your thoughtful approach to dining services. Yeah, thank you, Lander. Um, welcome to the, the folks on the call today. Um, I think I'll talk about um, first the union operation that we're um, working with, and then I'll um, pop over to food service area. Um, so um, in, in our, um, we're in Houston, um, so you've probably seen us in the news recently with cases rising. Um, so we've had some, um, uh, some challenges going forward and we're actually reducing our um, capacity in terms of um, percentages in the city of Houston. But how we're handling it in the union and prepping for the fall semester is a couple things. Um, one is that um, in terms of our lounge and gathering spaces that all unions really have and um, is like the heart of the campus, um, we, we're looking at um, both hard and soft spaces, uh, hard and soft furniture, and we're reducing actually our lounge spaces by 50% um, and removing this, the seats um, and spaces for students to congregate. Um, we certainly want to trust our students, but also we don't want to give an opportunity for um, excess of gathering places for, that, for their lounge spaces as well. Um, our student organization spaces are um, in that same fashion in that we have um, a large student organization center and we're um, blocking off about half the Carroll spaces where organizations have um, space where they plan events and programs and such. Um, we've just, as the, the university has just instituted a mass requirement, so we're working on a, a, social, a social campaign um, of responsibility, both for the union as well as all of our operations on campus, which has been um, It'll be a, 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 a growing thing. Um, uh, the biggest concern I have is truthfully food services as well as our meeting and conference spaces. Um, we are following and, and um, watching the CDC requirements as well as our state requirements as well as our local guidance in terms of square footages and capacity. So um, our staff has built out 50% um, capacities, 25% capacities, and then 40 square foot capacities per student, per participant and all of our meeting room spaces. Um, and they, those have fluctuated over the last several months. So um, those are post action or websites so that as um, situations on the ground may continue to change, um, that our, our organizers of events know what capacities they will be following. And they will adhere to and we've actually rewrote some of our language in our contract stating that um, at the time of booking, this is the confirmed capacity, but um, reductions and or um, Cancellations may may um, occur when situations call for that. So right now we're at 25% capacity, um, and we're also using the 40 square foot model, which mirrors what we're using in our classroom spaces. Um, we've also taken the uh, I think the forward thinking step in of not booking events in our union from off campus um, events and groups. So we're only doing organizations and um, the campus departments events. Um, in terms of um, staffing, we are um, looking at a staggered work schedule um, so that um, when we go back to campus, we're um, still remote working. Um, we will be developing um, a two or three day per week per staff member and then also doing some um, early shifts as well as some at late afternoon evening shifts to minimize the, the number of people that are in any of the offices at any one time. 
In terms of cleaning and maintenance, um, we uh, have given up a couple of our spaces for classes um, in the building, um, but we're having continuously cleaning of those um, spaces for class as well as all of our meeting rooms. Um, and installed a hand sanitizer throughout the building. Um, and then also installed sneeze and plexiglass um, for all of our offices and information centers and such. Um, for dining, um, we have um, worked with our dining services partners. We have a contract at U of H and our auxiliary services friends that manage the contract. Um, so we have one-way traffic management throughout our facilities in terms of pickup, in terms of ordering. Um, we have social distancing in our kitchens and back of the house areas. Um, we have capacity thresholds for each dining area location, 50% um, currently in Texas, that's what we're following. Um, elimination of um, cash handling completely. Um, and then signage at all hand washing and sink stations throughout the building and all the restrooms. And we've been using a lot of floor decals in terms of placement um, for signs to, for our staff, but also most importantly for our students and faculty and staff to come into our buildings. Um, we've also um, done a good job, I think, in terms of looking at the ordering process. So um, we've added some food lockers in one of our retail areas that um, students can order and, um, again, um, pay via um, Kuru card or um, credit card and pick up their um, orders through locker stations. Um, we also have, um, we're really focusing on ordering through Boost, which is um, the mobile app that, we, that Chartwells uses. Um, and we've also diversified the pickup stations in the building. So although we have two core kitchens in our building, um, we have um, three different pickup stations by different contract partners um, that are being um, pickup locations. And then um, we're lucky in that, that we are one of the campuses that have the robot delivery system. Um, and that is um, gonna be a great, great opportunity for um, our students um, and as well as our staff and faculty who don't want to come and leave their offices and that can get, get um, the robot, the delivery service um, sent to them. They've also developed um, a shop on campus web-based portal for bulk, bulk orders, primarily for our students in residence halls, but um, students can buy things on their career card as well as parents can purchase things on that bulk um, web-based portal um, that can be delivered to their, um, their residence hall location or picked up. Um, and then um, communication and digital signage and signage and communication more all over the place. So. Um, in terms of in terms of that, that's where we're at. I think the questions that we're struggling with is um, making sure that the health and safety of everyone who comes in the building is um, at the forefront of everyone's minds, um, and that um, we also don't um, lower our guard in terms of event management with risk um, with catering operations. We um, have an open campus when it comes to catering, so that um, uh, Chartwells does the majority of our catering, but we also have catering companies from the city of Houston that have access to our buildings and our campus. So I'm um, working really hard to ensure that um, we have um, uh, safety standards from those companies. We've um, amped up the safety requirements um, of those um, companies that are coming in from off campus. Um, and, and again, finally, also the, the, social, the student engagement piece is also something that we've been looking at in terms of how do we um, can't you to have that student experience for our students when we have um, some students be coming into class and also a number of students that would be going online, either fully online or partially online. So we've worked with um, our IT partners um, and developed a Zoom. Uh, we're using Zoom, but uh, streaming on Vimeo for all of our weeks of welcome activities. We have a couple large concerts and a couple comedians scheduled um, that will hopefully uh, help to engage students in um, the campus as well as a lot of our other um, programs that will be done virtually as well. So I think I'll, I'll stop there, Lander, and, um, and I'll wait for the question period if that works for everybody. That works great, as a matter of fact, and we already have questions coming in. I'm very excited about it. And what I wanna do is um, ask if I have James um, back. Dr. Bridgeforth, do I have you back? So he is having some difficulties with his phone line. Um, and so what I'm going to do is uh, continue with um, Tom Becker. And then I'm gonna come back to you, James, and see if we can't um, get it sorted out, all right? So uh, let me go to um, our panelist, Jay Thomas Becker, 
Associate Vice President for Academic and Research Facilities, Jefferson, which is Philadelphia University plus Thomas Jefferson University. Tom has overseen plan operations and new construction at the East Falls, formerly Philadelphia University campus for over 30 years. Under his guidance, Philadelphia University received APA's coveted Baldridge-based Award for Excellence in Facilities Management, the highest institutional award given by APA, first in 2009 and then successfully maintaining this five-year continued distinction in 2014. In 2013, the university was further pleased to accept APA's Sustainability Award. Tom holds his PE license, has an MBA, and earned the EFP and then the CEFP, Certified Educational Facilities Professional, credential designations. He was in fact a past chair of APA's credentialing board. Tom has frequently contributed to APA's publications and articles, including editor-in-chief of the uh, infamous Staffing Guidelines Trilogy, and is a huge advocate for professional development within the facilities profession. Tom, let's consider the differences of your med ed institution and get a broad-based facilities perspective on the challenges you are facing in creating that safe environment for returning students. Pick up. Uh, you always huh? pick up pointers and, and can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, uh, so I've listened to a number of these and you always pick up pointers and I, I, I was picking up some pointers just listening to Keith and jotting them down as we went. Uh, and uh, from our conversation the other night, James has got a lot of uh, good things to add, so I hope that he can get back on here soon. Uh, earlier in, the, in, these, these, uh, in this series, Mike Johnson and Lynn Finn did an excellent presentation about having uh, plans and having exit ramps and uh, having those exit ramps embedded in your plans. I think it's critical to have that and we'll talk about that a little more. And then uh, if, you, if those of you that are on the call, if you go back and look at some of Jim Jackson's work with uh, mapping and uh, particularly the transportation and barriers information, it, it, those details have already been presented and, and are available for you. Uh, and going back to the, you, you have to have a plan, and, and it's and it's important to have the best plan that you you can. But you have to realize that more than likely that plan is is going to get uh, disheveled the first uh, with some of the first impacts or changes that things outside of your control throw at you. Um, Thomas Jefferson uh, University has been the benefactor of going through our local peak on the clinical side in advance of our university relaunch. We have internal lessons learned and are steeped in medically, medical and medically related facility expertise. And the management practices used follow emergency management protocols and they're still in place today. Uh, we have an infectious disease person that sits right on those calls. But not, almost none of us have ever experienced a pandemic, certainly not in my lifetime and I'm, I'm getting long in the tooth. <laughs> and then suddenly, from New York to New Jersey to Philadelphia corridor became the hot spot of the nation. And for, mat for that matter, the world, we were hearing projections that Philadelphia was going to be the next New York. And, and uh, we took it to heart to, to try to do everything we could to, to stop it. Uh, and, and I think we were, we were pretty effective. And that, that's not just from Jefferson's perspective, it's from the whole community and the state. There no, you have to realize, going into this, guys, you're getting ready to relaunch, there's no vaccination and there's no magic cure. It's about diligence and sound practices. And, and, and that's what's enabled Jefferson to be highly effective in overcoming this disease. On the clinical side, in our 14 hospitals, we've only had a 1% transmission rate to our staff and, uh, and none to our non-related uh, COVID patients. So, you know, that's, and that's incredible, and we're trying to implement a number of those practices into the relaunch program that we're doing at our university. Logistics and, and uh, sourcing are critical. You must have the appropriate supplies. If you don't have the appropriate supplies, your plans are going to be compromised. Making a sound decision early is likely to be more valuable than the best decision at a later time. And that is one of my boss's favorite practices uh, pieces of advice, and staying ahead of this disease is more critical than anything you might do later to make amends. 
So let's talk about Jefferson's experience and the plan we have for the academic relaunch. Jefferson has two main campuses, right in Center City, very close to Old City in Philadelphia, if you're familiar with Philadelphia, and then the East Wall section of, of Philadelphia, which is more rural and uh, hill-like, uh, right next to the Schuylkill and, and Wissick and Crick intersection. Uh, then we have a number of surrounding campuses in the, in the uh, counties in Pennsylvania and over in New Jersey. Our history was that at spring break, uh, with this, at spring break, prior to uh, student occurrences of, of any uh, COVID-related concerns, uh, we went to 100% online delivery. Uh, we were just not prepared to handle, you know, a medical peak uh, that was projected to hit our city and our campus uh, while trying to conduct classes uh, on site. Uh, and in, you know, in retrospect, that decision would have been made for us a few weeks after we made the decision because um, Philadelphia and Pennsylvania went to a mandate to uh, that higher ed was, was considered non-essential. And you may find that happen in your areas as you go to relaunch, so be prepared. We were fortunate to have robust in instructional delivery technology and have been training up our faculty on the past, for the past several years. But we're also an experienced institution and I'm sorry, a, an empirical institution. So hands-on delivery uh, had to be done in different ways. You know, right now we're doing uh, gross anatomy, uh, you know, remotely with, uh, with technology. How does that, what does that mean to the facility department? Well, if your computers go down, uh, you're in a lot of trouble. So, you know, we had a big checklist going into this that we learned from the medical side. And, and part of that was assuring all of our backup emergency systems uh, were all tested, ready to go. Uh, and we went through a few of those things uh, during, the, during this time successfully. Uh, but now we're gonna do it in person. One thing that happened here was our essential, we determined that our essential personnel were never stood down. Uh, we've been working at our institution, trying to get ready for this relaunch uh, right through. And, uh, that meant we had to do things in a different way and socially distance our staffs, put them on different shifts, uh, put them on different work days and try to distribute that, uh, that uh, potential to, to be in infected. Uh, that wasn't 100% successful. Uh, within our staffs, we did have um, some infection that came in, mostly that time that comes in through uh, homebound sources, that type of thing. Unfortunately, at, at this location, uh, all of our staff recovered successfully and they're all back to work. Uh, that, that wasn't the case in, in every location. Uh, <clears throat> we've maintained academic and enterprise command stations throughout the crisis and um, throughout instructional delivery. And now that's transitioned to the relaunch committee. We're on, we're on the backside of the curve and our primary focus now is to get restarted and not have another bump or increase in the curve. We have a public uh, relaunch guide, which is out on the web, and uh, we were able to share that with APA, and you're able to, to go into APA's webpage now and, and uh, take a look at that, download it. Um, that's backed up by a much more detailed relaunch guide that is more prescriptive for the individual departments. This is for the public and, and it gives an idea of what we're doing um, so that uh, they can be assured, but also understand our limitations. So I'll go into some of the details of what that meant, what that means for uh, facilities and just some things that, that uh, you can uh, jot down if, if you want to, to, uh, to, to maybe uh, have a checklist for yourself. So the very first thing that we, want to talk about it or is training your staff. The staffs have to be trained to conduct themselves safely in a COVID-19 environment. And that is that is a different different animal. It is diligence. It's it's always being masked. It's being gloved up when you need to be. It's, it's eye protection when you need to be, um, but always masked. And you know at, at this point the city of Philadelphia has gone back to an all mask protocol, but at times when Philadelphia was not in all mass protocol, we were still all masked up. Um, and that's very helpful. The, uh, 
the uh, we have an impact team that's capable to, with full PPE to go in and sanitize areas from top to bottom. And that includes uh, electrostatic mist for anything that is uh, more difficult to get to than, than to uh, wipe down. All of our equipment uh, in terms of vacuum cleaners and so forth have been upgraded to HEPA grade. Uh, you don't want to spread around dust. That hasn't really been um, proven as, uh, from what I understand for the, from the COVID perspective, but you don't want to take a chance and you don't want to have other things going around. Supplies have been reviewed and updated to assure that this infectant capabilities and all of those are checked with our infection disease expert. Um, as I mentioned, we have our, our disinfected electrostatic mist uh, sources and they're hand applied. We don't have machines that go in and do a whole room. You know, this is point and shoot. Something you might want to talk about is your hand sanitizers. And you know, we determined that our, uh, for one thing, supplies are difficult to get. And we're, we encourage hand washing and we have a lot of signage about that, but we have uh, hands-free hand sanitizer stations at every building location and at every uh, elevator station. And let's talk about just walking into a building and trying to encourage the culture of co-protection. So when you walk into our buildings, uh, uh, it gives you, you know, graphical uh, representation that you're continue to be masked up, wash your hands, uh, that type of thing. But there's also an attestation there that indicates that you're pledging that you've you've checked your temperature, you don't have a cough, you don't have my muscle aches, and uh, you know you're prepared to to uh, to be part of a of a of the culture that that is going to protect each other. Uh, there's a number of things there that, that are their checklists as you go into the building. Uh, and, and we're hoping that this is a reminder every time somebody goes in and out of our, uh, of our buildings that, uh, that they're to do that. The other thing that we've done in Philadelphia University prior to becoming part of Jefferson, and Jefferson itself has always been open to the community. Uh, we, you know, the public walks our campus, we're the park. Uh, in downtown, we're some of the nicest areas, but we're going to go to a policy as we relaunch into uh, the semester that we're going to exclude the public from our campus um, because of the incidental occurrences that are that can happen when when people aren't taking the same precautions that we're demanding of our students. Um, getting back to the buildings, you know, we've gone through top to bottom deep cleaning. All of our buildings were fresh air flushed and um, their HVAC, HVAC filters are upgraded to MERV 13 or better where it was possible. You can't do that everywhere. Sometimes your systems just aren't capable of doing that. So our fallback to that is to use an antimicrobial filter uh, for anything that's lower than that. And uh, you know that's a fallback, but it, it's, uh, they are usually available for any of your uh, PTAC units and so forth. Um, don't forget about your potable hot water, particularly if you've been shut down for a while. You know, you have to flush those systems, particularly the hot water systems. You know, Philadelphia has got the distinction of being the, uh, the location where Legionella disease started, and that's what you can get when you have systems that have been down for a while. So make sure you flush before you restart. We have, we have meetings on a weekly basis with our facilities and, uh, and housekeeping staffs to make sure we're in alignment and we have a Google Docs that, uh, instrument that we use as we check off all of the criteria going through all of our buildings. From a student union standpoint, our kitchen areas are going to be scrubbed and sanitized daily with the combined efforts of our food service and custodial. The eating and serving areas will be wiped down throughout their usage. We'll also have wipes available for our students to do it individually as they uh, as the tables get turned over. We're going to a primarily order and pick up system in all of our dining halls and uh, courts. Vending machines are gonna be wiped down daily. Bathroom cleans are on a, depending upon the uh, usage of the bathroom, are uh, on a, a at least a twice a shift uh, sequence and with a chart there for visibility so that 
our public knows that the uh, housekeepers have been in there and, and checked them off. We weren't doing that for a number of years. We thought it added clutter, but now in this environment, we have to go back to doing that. And we would advise that you also use your EV markers and uh, do an audit of your bathrooms uh, several times a week to make sure that they are being cleaned and, and the UV detection can, can help with that. Meeting rooms and classrooms are once a day and all of our classrooms will have wipe dispensers so that the uh, students can take it upon themselves to self-protect. In residential halls, you know, we made the, uh, the critical decision to go to single room occupancy. And that's really uh, required us to push some of our students off campus, uh, upperclassmen primarily, uh, and, uh, and go out into the market for additional housing. Um, the cost impacts are going to be substantial. We're not exactly sure where we're going to end up with this. We're traditionally a campus that runs in the black. Um, I think both campuses are 180 years, 130 years have always run in the black. Uh, but that is not as, as critical right now as getting through this successfully. So, uh, so what can happen, you know? Um, You've got all this planning, you know. <laughs> you know, why won't you be? Why would? What could possibly happen to be success for you to to, to mess with your success? Well, there's a lot of external uh, elements that can happen. For one thing, we're we're talking about a population of 18 to 22 year olds, and uh, you know, as I mentioned, I'm a little older, so I've, my kids have gone through that stage. That maybe wasn't their most responsible stage in life, and. Uh, you know, you've, you've got a lot of people that are going to be bringing things onto your campus. It can happen so easily. And a lot of those are, are asymptomatic uh, patients or that, uh, that don't even know they're sick. They don't know they're hurting anybody. They feel fine, yet they can carry this disease for several days and infect a number of people. So the mass prop, you know, the mass diligence is just so important. And then there's always the other authorities that can come in and tell you what to do. And just in, in our sports arena, we have the NCAA, we have our conferences, State Department of Education, state government, uh, adjacent state governments. Maybe your, your teams can't even go to the other state. Maybe they can't come back. Um, you know, your fellow institutions and, um, and of course, the city. Um, when you come back to this, uh, you know what are your what are your measurements of success? And uh, you know right now our measurement of success that that we're hoping for is that any incident rate that we have on our campus and we're anticipating an incident rate will be lower than the surrounding community. If we're if we're lower than the surrounding community, we think we're we're doing a pretty good job. We'd love to have no incidents, but we know that that's just not practical. And in the in the course of this, one other thing you just want to remember. This is a lot of stress. So try to make sure that your people have time to take and that, um, that you celebrate your wins and, uh, and it, you know, you, you enjoy your successes along with all the, with all the trouble that you're going to go through to make this, uh, and get through this. And, um, if some of you have, uh, are Ellen, some, uh, fans or whatever, you know, one of the things in the middle of all of this, um, you know, one of our nursing teams just took a break and did a little video for Ellen, and, and uh, that really broke a lot of attention. So we hope to do some of those things with our students and with ourselves and, uh, and roll up our sleeves and get into this. Uh, and that's where we're at at, at Thomas Jefferson University, Lander. That's absolutely terrific, Tom. I really appreciate um, your comprehensive look at um, what you're doing. I know it helped people immensely and we will have questions that are uh, coming up from the comments that both Tom and Keith have made. I believe that I now have um, James. So James, so you're uh, one, there he is. Okay, so I'm gonna cue him with, James, let's hear the strategies you're deploying for your residential housing community, along with some practices that others could adopt. Yes, good afternoon, everybody. I'm so happy to be with you and Lander. Thank you for such a wonderful bio at the beginning. I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to spend a few minutes talking through um, some of the general strategies that 
we're using some here at South Alabama and some other institutions are using, I will say this, to everyone on the call, thank you so much for your leadership because this is an extraordinary time and it takes innovative leaders and I know all of you are doing that. And so some of these things I'm gonna share today are just strategies that I've gotten from colleagues and things that we're doing. I'll start with move in. Move in for many of us on our campuses is the welcome and introductory to campus life for students. And it's a time when we bring our faculty and students together. And this year, many of us are doing move in a different way. And I would challenge you all to think about doing it in a different way. For many of us, including our campus, we're doing weekend as opposed to move in as opposed to a day over the course of a week, limiting the number of students um, to about 10% of our population each day. And we're, we're working through SARES to ensure that they can schedule a check-in time so we know that when they're coming. And like many of you, we're doing a drive-through um, check-in. So they'll literally drive up. We're limiting the number of people they can bring with them. We're pre-scanning them. And, and that's one of the things I wanna highlight. If you're doing a move-in, if you can do it, try to do a two-fold screen if you can't test. And everybody can't test, it's very, hard to do. But one of the things that we're doing on our campus is we're having our student health center do a email screen of questions of them two days before they come. And then when they come to campus, we're doing literally a drive up screen where we're taking temperature and checking some things out while they're in the car. And if any flags come up, then we'll pull them out and we'll work through whatever the issues are. So moving is gonna be very important. The other thing about moving, many of us have moving uh, faculty and staff here to help welcome students or RAs in place. Um, this year, we're not doing that, and many campuses are not. We're having students come and move themselves in, and, and our staff will be available, but we'll have very limited face-to-face um, -face contact with them in, in that way. We'll, we will do um, our move-in meetings, and I think someone said this earlier today, we'll do those move-in meetings virtually and those first-floor meeting, first meetings virtually, but trying to find ways to keep social distancing. And that may be a challenge for some of our new students and parents without having to move in support, but we're sharing with them up front that the idea is to welcome your student in the safest way possible. The other thing that a lot of folks are talking about right now, and we're certainly doing this on our campus, is this idea of how you manage the, the, the gathering spaces. Um, many of our housing, housing buildings and residence halls are really true places of community that students are spending time in our lobbies and our lounges, they're studying there, they're having pizza there, and it is their home. Um, but many of us have spaces that are designed for 20, 30 people or more, some of our lobbies and lounges. So that's, that's just not really where we are today, given the challenges, challenges with COVID. So what we're doing, instead of moving all the furniture out, we're working with our publications department, which is an auxiliary here for us. And we're getting these vinyl stickers that will allow us to literally um, take furniture out of the rotation for students, basically putting signage on them to say, don't use it. And so we're strategically lessening the number or amount of furniture, but allowing them to have social distances in that, in, that, in that area. We'll have our RAs and some of our hall staff work with students to try to help them understand and work with them to ensure that they're following that. But this is a way for us to really minimize the, the traffic in, in those areas and limit the social distancing. And so far, it seems to be an effective measure and our student center here is doing the same. The other thing that you may hear a lot about right now is this idea of occupancy. And if you're in housing, occupancy is critically important because most of us are complete auxiliary. So addressing the occupancy and limiting the occupancy can really be difficult. But many of us, including South Alabama, we are limiting our op occupancy um, and trying to find ways to work within COVID. So for us, We've tried to make uh, as, as many rooms as possible private. Here, it's about 50%. And some of that was already private rooms. So that wasn't really a big challenge for us for those who were private rooms. But we took one building completely offline and made it private rooms. And that made it easier for our students to give them the option and make them feel more comfortable. Most of our students are gonna be in a two-person room, but we have that option for them. And then the other option for us is that we took another community, half of that community, and made it available for quarantine beds in case we need to move them. Now, we have a pretty good system, I think, in place for quarantine and how we work with students, but we have a student health center um, on our campus that reports up through student affairs. So our protocol is really to work with them, and they will determine who needs to be quarantined. We'll work with them to quarantine those students. But that, but changing our occupancy in that way um, really does impact our, our, our occupancy and potentially our, our revenue. 
but we're trying to manage COVID-19 in a way where students do feel safe. And by doing that, I think it's helped us. We have had very few students reach out to us and say that they wanted to um, not come to campus this year, that we're concerned about it because they know they have the opportunity to have a private room and that we have those quarantine rooms available. So those things have been very helpful. Many of you, like us, have desk, and the desk really is the front and center for your students. The desk, if you're like us, provide um, gaming stations or gaming tables or just information to folks around your campus, and the desks are really important. And this year for us, it's really important because we're, we're starting some new, some new incentives here. So what we've done with our desk, instead of deactivating them or disabling them, we have designed and worked with a company to get some acrylic screens. These screens will allow, will allow our desk staff to still engage students, but yet try to prevent the spread. And that, that's going to work for us. And we have our own custodians in our housing program. And so our custodial team is going to work with our desk staff to make sure that there is a regular rotation of clean, clean desk and, and clean lobbies and working with those screens. But what we found is that that relationship with our custodians is really important because it can help us also identify areas of high use. So we really appreciate that for them. Appreciate that from them. Two big pieces that you guys have probably talked about that we are really implementing is a mass policy. Our policy here will be pretty strong and that our policy is that anytime a student is outside of the residence hall room, they're required to wear a, or wear a mask. Unless they're outside socially distancing and, and doing some type of physical activity. So that's going to be a challenge for us. And we've spent a lot of time talking about how we're going to do that. So we're, we're working on our, our social media campaigns to do that. But we're going to rely on our student leaders, um, our SGA president, our SGA team, our RAs some of our other student leaders to work with students to help them understand the idea of social responsibility from a COVID-19 perspective and helping them to understand that if they can be a part of the solution by masking up and practicing social distancing, that they, they would really help us prevent the spread. In our program here in housing, we also have the fraternity and sorority houses, which gives us an opportunity to really work on this student experience. But that also brings up the idea of events and how do you do events. So our policy right now is to limit, as of today, um, the large parties that we would have and limit our social activities to, to 10 people or less. And even that, we have to really talk through that with our campus but we're trying to work with them to do more virtual programs, even chapter meeting, can we do those things virtually? And how can we manage from this point until January and see what the research tells us? The last thing, or one of the last things you guys are probably asking about is checkout. How are you doing checkout? And what if we have to close and do a checkout? Um, in the spring, we did something that was pretty powerful here. We were able to do personless or contactless checkouts. Essentially, we had all the students drop their keys off um, at a drop box in the housing office, and we allowed our staff to wait um, three business days before they went to check the room and do the physical checkout. That worked out very well for our RAs and our, our community directors, which are all directors everywhere else, and, and our staff. And so that allowed us to really work through um, helping people feel safe and feeling comfortable. This fall, we're planning to um, continue with a normal checkout process but we're going to ask our students and staff to have the appropriate PPE. But if there's an impacted room, we're going to think about how we wait to do that. We are talking about how we clean the sterilized rooms. And like I said earlier, we have three options. We have our own custodial team here in housing, and they can do um, the lion's share of the work. But there are some there's some circumstances where we might want to use a contracted cleaner, which we do have for, for housing we use in the summer, normally for our summer term. And we also contract with SurfPro if it's really extreme. So given the situation, we'll use one of those options. And the students feel very comfortable with that, and so do our staff. Most of our custodians have done a an amazing job really helping us to identify where students are, because we have a few in the summer, 44, and giving us a good idea of what the fall could look like. So we're working through some of those pieces now, but overall, I think that where we are in housing here is, is really a microcosm of where other places are, really building a foundation of support for students. And I think over the next two weeks, as Lander started off saying, we're gonna have to make a lot of decisions. And I think some of those decisions are going to be, how do we ramp up in a state like Alabama that really is on the higher end now to be prepared to address students as they move in and as, as they move out? Um, so 
I, I think for us, it is really about this opportunity of how we educate students. And I think if we can educate students up front with COVID and how they can protect themselves, we can really not only minimize the, the spread, but help, help our communities be stronger. So I'll, I'll pause there. I know there'll probably be questions. And thank you, Landa, for the opportunity. This is fantastic, James. Um, all three of you have just done exactly what I was hoping to give, such a comprehensive view of what you're doing in these critical areas, because you are right on the front line, frankly, uh, with all of this, between the facility side that Tom talked about and bridged over to uh, both unions, Keith, uh, and then James in, house, in housing. Uh, we could be uh, more blessed to have all three of you uh, given the opening remarks. And we have a ton of questions, <laughs> and it's really great. So James, um, I am gonna um, ask you first, and I'm gonna keep moving through people, but let me ask you this first. Are you allowing residents to have friends and family accompany them during move-in? Yes, we limit it to two, either two. family or friends. They can have two what we call guests with them. Yes. Okay, two. All right. So we want to reinforce that, folks. As you asked that, you asked how many, and if they could enter the housing buildings, and it sounds like that's a yes. Okay. So two and yes. Yes. Yes, mm -hmm. they can. Okay, good. And then um, you were talking, James, about masks required um, outside their rooms. It sounds like when you leave your room, you need to have a mask on, right? Unless you're outside and can social distance. So I want to make sure we got clarity because uh, some folks were asking for more clarity on that. Yes, that is correct. And we're providing every student, every student with two masks when they arrive. So yes, unless they're outside, socially distanced and doing some physical activity. Um, and that is mainly because a lot of our students take basically what we call the JAG train. It's our little busing system. And so we have to make sure that when they get on the, the, the JAG train system, that they are practicing the, mask, practicing the masking policy. And going back to the first question about family members and friends, they're required to wear a mask and they're, go, they have, they're required to go through the screening process with their student when they arrive as well. Oh, that's excellent, um, Ad. I really appreciate that. I think that really helps people understand how far you've gone with this and why. Um, and then um, there was a, a question related to that, and that is, do you allow school students and staff to not wear masks in lounges or hallways? It sounds like you've got a pretty strict mask policy that once you ex exit your um, space, you need to have a mask on and you need to have it right there ready in case you um, are impacting anyone. Is that correct, James? That's correct. Anytime they're outside of their room, they're required to wear the mask. And, it, and even for staff, anytime we're outside of our offices, we're required to wear a mask. So it, it goes both ways. That's correct. Okay, excellent. And Keith, I wanted to, um, I wanted to, to touch uh, that with you in terms of um, the mask kind of in in um, I'm gonna I'm not gonna say enforcement yet because I'm gonna ask that as a separate question but you're handling masks similarly right uh, absolutely the exact same way that James is is handling it at, at South Alabama okay um, excellent so um, now I'm gonna ask all of you and and I'll start with Keith and then I'll go to Tom and uh, ultimately to you James. Um, is how do you plan to enforce mask policy with students? Now we're into that enforce word and that's become oh, interesting. Uh, and I think you talked about it uh, in terms of peer pressure, et cetera, but could you elaborate just a little bit, Keith, and then I'll go to James and Tom? Yeah, yeah, peer pressure certainly is the, the most important thing for our students. Um, so uh, enforcement is a, it's the silver bullet question, right? Um, we, uh, we have processes for warnings and then we have processes for um, handling it. So um, students are a referral to the Dean of Students Office um, for not um, following through on university policy. Um, staff will be handled by human resources with their um, department director um, or appropriate authority um, figure. And then um, faculty is being handled by the provost office. Um, but we hope we don't have to get there, obviously. The president at U of H is actually starting a mass competition so that she'll be recognizing masks two or three per week um, on her Twitter. She's very active on Twitter. Um, so that um, kind of recognize the fact that each department and organization can um, purchase masks um, and give them out to people. So I think that's a really unique um, idea that she started. So um, yes, yeah, 
but we have we have some enforcement. I don't know how effective it will be, just being honest. That's fantastic. Um, I, I really appreciate um, you elaborating on that because I think it helps people know that you're you're you you've got a process in terms of student discipline, et cetera, and um, you're planning to use it. Um, James, do, are, is, is that sort of similar? It's the exact same process. Yeah, um, exact exact same thing. We're hoping though we can provide more peer pressure before they get to the student conduct process, but we're doing the exact same thing. Perfect. The student conduct process, that's exactly what I was trying to remember, the language, um, and you have really great systems. Tom, do you want uh, do you want to touch that? Well, it would be a replication, really. Uh, okay. You know, thus far, we've had uh, not as much students on, not as many students on our, on our campuses, except in the medical field at Center City, and and they're, you know, those those guys, if, as you can see from that aerial photo, they're proponents. They understand. Um, so we'll be, it'll be interesting to see whether the peer pressure on the East Falls campus with the the broader base of of uh, students is effective. Okay. Um, Good. Good. And Tom, so I want to go to you, and this is about excluding the public. Um, and I think you and Keith both talked about this, but Tom. Um, how will you be um, enforcing the exclusion of the public? Because I know you're in an urban space and that makes it difficult and so is the University of Houston. So yeah. um, what, are, what is your planned approach to that? So um, on the East Falls campus, uh, we've, we've got uh, <laughs> signs around that are being put up around our campus, um, close to 100 of them, and then at, at every building. And uh, they we're, we're going to require people to show their Jefferson ID. It's uh, not a practice that, that was always in the university, but it was certainly a practice in all of our hospitals. But uh, now, you know, if you don't have a Jefferson ID uh, showing, you're going to be asked to leave the building and then and, and informed that uh, the campus is closed to the public. Perfect. Keith? Yeah, Leonard, our, our policy is strictly about the union, that we are not booking events with outside um, groups. Um, the campus does not have a, um, a policy like, like Tom's does, um, but we are not booking events from outside um, companies and or groups. Okay, good. I, I, I thought that's what you had said, so that's terrific. Okay, so now I'm going to go to a different question. Um, or actually a statement, Tom, uh, there was an announcement by Westchester University that they're moving from hybrid model to completely online. Do you, or can you um, give them advice on whether you see this happening in Southeastern PA, Pennsylvania? Well, I think it's certainly one of our exit ramps, you know, and um, that's a choice, whether you can deliver your, you think you can deliver uh, instruction safely or, or or not, we think we can, uh, and we we value the uh, the experiential component. But we're prepared, just like Westchester, to go fully online if uh, we get a resurgence. And what we're trying to do is set those benchmarks. Now that's still in discussion in our relaunch committees. Is when do we make that decision? And you know what? Are, you know, and it's all by KPIs. You know, and you're looking at your your uh, your infection rate. So as we start to see that. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, we'll, we will make that move. That's great. And I loved how you put that, Tom, that it's um, actually one of the exit ramps. And if folks are not planning exit ramps for a variety of different scenarios, it would be important that you know to do that. So you've, re you've reinforced that beautifully. This is a question for Keith, um, although anyone can also answer. It's about monitoring public lounge spaces in the union. Um, will you allow students to sit on the floor? Are there clear conduct protocols? Um, are you, I, I'm assuming you're going to use signage to a certain extent for this. Um, can you elaborate? Sure. We have, um, we have, uh, we will have when we open <laughs> at that point, and we're still um, uh, not open to the public as at this point. Um, we will have signage all over the building. Um, we've worked really closely with University of Marketing to develop some um, really fun, but also direct signage. Um, and then we've actually, we have a, a number of student employees with our reduction meeting room services and such that we're, we have hired to maintain work. So um, some AD staff and some other folks will be monitoring the building for those common spaces to make sure that they're following the, the signage and the policy in, inside the student center. Excellent. James, do you want to 
Do you want to touch on that? Sure, I can. So um, we're following right now our normal visitation policy. We haven't changed that yet. We're still talking through that. But um, for our for our lounges and our lobbies, we have clear signage that basically supports social distancing. And what we're doing is we're limiting the, the actual furniture that can be used in those areas. But we will have um, our hall staff We'll do the monitoring in the halls and encourage students. We have a lot of we have a lot of cameras here, and so that will help us as well. But we think if we share with the students from day one in the first floor meetings and why it's important, we think we'll get them on board with following through on that. So I think it's I think it's going to work out just fine. That's excellent. And um, James, I'm going to um, go to you for uh, someone asked what factors went into deciding to use signage versus removing items in furniture. Do you think that students will use yeah. signs, or what's your sense? That's a great question, and it's really a selfish one from a facilities perspective. We just had nowhere to store the furniture, uh -huh. um, and we talked about it for a while, and it really became. Um, cost prohibitive for us to do that, particularly when we thought, you know, when we think, you know, in, in spring we may need to bring the furniture back. Um, and then a lot of times with some of the moving is challenging here um, to get it to and from off campus. So we figured it was best to leave it there uh, and, and repurpose it that way. So, yeah. Perfect. That's great. Keith, do you want to? Do you want to, because um, that did come up, as a matter of fact, Keith, I'm going to add a little bit to that, and that was around um, this uh, idea of storage of unused furniture on-site, off-site, um, and uh, James has just spoken to that as part of his. Can, can you help me on that side? Sure, sure. we um, have taken um, some small meeting rooms offline. Um, since they couldn't really be used in this environment anyway for um, 10 people or six feet. And um, so we're actually storing a lot of our furniture in um, those small rooms. And we're also storing some of our, our, our um, uh, locations where we have storage. You probably can't fit more than a Mickey Mouse in at this point um, because they're pretty packed with things. Um, so we've tried as much as we can, but we wanted to, we love our students and, and think they'll do the right thing, but we also didn't want to give them any opportunity to, to bend the rules if you will. Mm -hmm. That's terrific. That That's really a, a very creative approach to this. Um, Tom, I'm going to take us to um, some questions that occurred early on um, about wastewater uh, and whether, so Tom, maybe you can speak to the validity and accuracy of testing wastewater and sewage um, from buildings for COVID. Have you heard of that? Given your background, I would think you may have and then I might be able to help address it as well. So Lander, as far as I'm aware, we, we have not gotten into a program of testing any of the, the wastewater for, um, for COVID contamination. Um, okay. We're not planning on doing that in our relaunch year. Okay, very good. And I have heard of this um, testing water effluents at the University of Arizona. So if the individual who asked that question wants to shoot me, lander at appa.org, an email, I am attempting to get in touch with that person so that we can find out some more information. So please don't hesitate to do that. Um, and then um, was it you, Tom, that talked about the robot delivery system or was that Keith? That was here at University of Houston. Uh, okay, Keith, can you, can you address that? It's, it's, the question was, what is the robot delivery system? Sure. Um, well, Chartwells um, did a test um, a year and a half ago of these um, small silver robots that are on wheels. They look really cute, some of our students say, um, and they can fit um, two meals inside. So students are able to order um, the dining services platform um, and pay on the dining services platform. And then the robots map out the course across the campus. Um, it took them about two months to have the whole campus mapped, um, crossing roads and such. Um, and they deliver. Um, and students just have the opportunity to go out and, and open the little robot and pick up their um, food. Um, and then the robot goes back to wherever their next order is coming from. So we have about six different locations where food is prepared on campus and those robots um, go back to one of the locations that's next in line of ordering. That's amazing, I'm telling you. Can you talk about um, 
the expense of that has that been um, sort of cost prohibitive for institutions, or do you think it's um, really possible? Yeah, I think um, our, our chart walls for food provider is the is the group that brought them to campus. Um, and my my sense is they were originally doing it as a test to see how effective it was going to be. And I have no doubt about they're going to keep them because um, we have not seen any um, negativity on the the walk up service at least before COVID happened. Um, while the robots while the robots were in action, so it's actually been a benefit to increasing food sales across the campus. Great. Okay, so it, be, it has become a cost effective um, thing as well, and it's um, rolling right in. Was your Keith Mobile food ordering prior to COVID? Did you have that in place? On the robots? Yes. No, the mobile food ordering. Just generally speaking, I think you have a platform where people order mo you know through mobile um, approach. Yeah, it's called Boost, um, and it was it was in place, um, but truthfully, not a lot of people used it. Um, but we're certainly going to ramp that up to make sure that people can use that um, again, um, and having separate drop-off points and pickup points around the building so that people can come and pick up their orders. Um, but I think we'll be uh, we'll see a lot of that happening through Boost now. That's excellent. It, it sounds like it's pretty easy to use. It is, and most of the items for all the retail places are on there. There's a few exceptions, um, but but yeah. So um, Panda Express and uh, McDonald's and Chick Fil A and all those different wonderful places students like to have um, are on there, and they can just order what they want, um, including special instructions, um, and it makes it really easy. Excellent. And so my last question around this is about the concerns about complexity of cashless. Um, engagement, any alternatives for those with only cash, or we're we're basically saying, hey, you need to be in the cashless world. Yeah, at this at this point, we're definitely in the cashless world. We are um, uh, strongly encouraging faculty and staff as well to um, put money on their dining plan or put put on their credit card. Um, but there won't be any cash accepted on, on our campus. At least that's the initial policy from U of H. Got it. Okay, that's excellent. So Tom, I'm gonna to come over to you, and this is about um, airborne spread. Someone who's concerned about airborne spread um, and the changes to HVAC. Can you speak to that um, in a little more detail? That would really help people. So we've been, you know, we started to look into that um, quite a bit, particularly in the hospital environment where we run a number of rooms under negative pressure and, and have barrier um, type of, of, of uh, air pressure requirements. But uh, what we're being really, what we're really looking at is that the primary source of transmission is within a few feet of uh, the person with, uh, you know, their, their breath and, and, the, and their, uh, their nasal discharges. The, uh, we looked at, whether we should go to a UV type of thing in our air handling systems, UV A and B uh, really aren't effective. UV C is uh, is marginal, uh, and uh, you know we we in the time that we had to get ready for the the surge that was projected to hit Philadelphia, you know, we discarded that. Uh, what we have looked at is is getting our MERV filters ratings up to 13 or 14. Uh, you really need to be close to 19 to, to stop this virus, but uh, when you get a little coating on your 13 or 14, you're in a, a lot better shape. But, uh, and then we use, we use scrubbers. So we have uh, their side stream scrubbers that we'll use in, uh, in uh, high impact areas where we may have a concern, like in our student medical areas, uh, for the start of school this year, we'll have a couple of scrubbers in there and uh, in any of our isolation uh, residential areas, we will have scrubbers uh, to side stream the, uh, the possible recirculation of the, of the virus. The only study that I know of where it has been transmitted through uh, the HVA C system or they only, uh, it, it was, uh, was in China and, and a lot of people go back to that to that uh, case, and I, I, I would suspect that there were other circumstances there, but our medical staff is is encouraging, you know, the mass systems and uh, shields over the, you know, 
that can be transmitted, we believe, uh, into your eyes. So use shields uh, when you're in real close, close proximity. But we have not uh, gone into elaborate HVAC system uh, cleaning. We, we don't think that it'd be effective. Got it. That's excellent, Tom. Thank you so much. I knew that you would give some insight into that. Um, and so uh, I'm going to go to um, James and, and and maybe all of you, but James, the uh, someone was asking with students that are in doubles and double groups, are you going to require a special waiver for the risk that they quote maybe taking? Because um, it certainly can't be your typical roommate agreement, right? No, that's a great question. We have not decided to do a special waiver for them. I am currently working um, with our general counsel's office to do a release, if you will, but not a uh, any type of special um, liability release there or waiver. Um, we, we think that most of our, our students will have some, some, some kind of roommate situation or a roommate paradigm. And so we're thinking through that now, though, as we get closer, given the things are spiking up here. So I think in the next week or so, we'll have more than that, more information on that, but we don't have a plan for that at this point. And what we thought about, if someone was uncomfortable, we would work with them. I think the challenge for us is going to be what happens when the contact tracing begins with roommates. But I think regardless, roommate or not, that is going to be a challenge because we have to figure out where the students are or have been. And we, we on our campus just the other, I think two weeks ago, we required a team of contact tracers that will be on campus working with us. So we'll have to figure through some of that. So I would suspect as we get closer to this, we may have some type of special waiver, but right now we don't just to release. Okay. Um, Keith, did you want to um chime in on that as well because then I'm going to go to toilets in the rooms and residence halls and what we might be doing so I'll just get you guys queued up to that. Pete did you want to add to that? Yeah you know I'm not sure what our uh, housing policy is currently in terms of a waiver for doubles mm -hmm. so I'm not aware of that um, I'm sorry. No no that's just fine. Tom do you have any of that in play? In terms of bathrooms and Toilets? Uh, uh, no, in, in terms of uh, students in doubles, I think you moved to totally singles. Oh. Did you? Yeah, we moved to all singles except in our uh, in our in our five bedroom apartments. We we have limited to three, and and we're going through some um, orientation with those students about uh, social distancing within the common areas of those apartments. But no, all freshman housing is. Um, it has been converted to singles, and um, so we're not we're not getting into those type of roommate agreements in that regard. Okay, all right, very good. Um, yeah, the question around um, bathrooms in residence halls was really around since they're not for one person. They said um, in instances where they aren't single occupancy, are you using things like plexiglass or Lexan in between sinks? Mm -hmm. And I'll ask. That's correct. Uh, yeah, Tom, you want to go for that? Mm -hmm. Sure. At this time, we haven't decided to go to that. Uh, we do have social distancing signs and wash your hand signs in all of our uh, in all of our bathrooms in our residential hall um, bath areas, but uh, we haven't gone to the, the extent of of, um, of putting the plexiglass in between the sinks. Uh, part part of that is whatever you put there, you're you know that's another thing you're going to be cleaning, and if you're not going to clean it, then you and you you better not have it. That's but, a great uh, point. The uh, you know, so I'll leave it at that. Yeah, that's a that's a really great point, James. Do you want to add to that? I can answer that, but um, it may not be helpful. We don't have any community bathrooms here at South Alabama, so we every student has their bath their own bathroom in their room. <laughs> So, well, then you solved that yeah, problem. We didn't you? <laughs> yes, we lucked out right there. Okay, very good. Um, Mary and Bracey asked a really interesting question. I'm going to ask all of you to think about this. Tom, I'm going to start with you on this one. Um, and that it's around um, pressure on certifications for clean facilities, actually certifying them. Are you getting any? There are a lot of companies out there. Um, Speaking to certifying your facilities with deep clean, et cetera, 
Um, and I think Marion asked a very good question about that. Tom, are you seeing or hearing of that and even considering this certifications for clean facilities? So what we what we do have is a is a very strong inspection policy. We don't have a third party certification uh, for our cleaning, but when we when you use the UV markers and they go around with an audit uh, with their electronic audit, it records that, and then it comes back, uh, downloads, and then gives you your KPI analysis as to whether uh, whether you're you know you're cleaning like you say you're cleaning. But it's, it's not a third party certification. That's really excellent. And that's a, um, a really great way of addressing it. Um, I appreciate that. Um, OK, so I'm going to go to um, a different question. And it's um, how each of you are considering handling students who contract the virus. Tom, do you want to? I think you were mentioning that. And then I'll go to Keith yeah. and James. Um, so handling sure. students. Mm -hmm. So uh, our initial, um, first of all, you start off generally with a, a POI, a person of interest. So you know the the student may uh, exhibit a, you know some symptoms or something like that. They go to the health center, uh, they take an evaluation, and they determine whether the student needs to be tested. Uh, once they're tested, um, we're going to send them uh, back to the room for isolation. Uh, until we understand, you know, whether the, the student has uh, has contracted the virus or not. Uh, once a, if if a positive test positive comes back, uh, our intention is to request the student to leave campus uh, and uh, convalesce at home. We will go in with our impact team and thoroughly um, scrub down a, that person's room from top to bottom um, for their return, and we're anticipating their return. In the instances where the student just can't go home, um, we do have, um, we've taken some residents offline and we're prepared to uh, isolate them on campus, um, provided that they don't need extensive medical care. If they need extensive medical care, we're going to, to ask them to, uh, to, to go to one of our hospitals. Got it. Others of you that would like to um, respond, any? I'll ask Keith and then yeah, maybe, can... yeah, go ahead. Either one. Okay, I can. Um, sure. So from from our perspective, we were very fortunate to have student health and they've been working with us for a couple of years on a number of initiatives. Our process right now is that if a student is a POI or of interest, we will not send them to the student health center. We want them to call and student health will screen them via te a telehealth appointment and make a determination as if they want to see them or not. We're creating a satellite health center in the residential community, or well, it's close to residential community, closer than um, the health center, and um, as our little COVID clinic model, if you will. And um, the students, if they need to be seen, they will go there. Once they're evaluated, if they test positive, then they will re they will have a mandatory quarantine to a, basically uh, a hall that will have available for quarantine students. Um, student health has advised us just earlier this week that they will they will encourage them to go home um, if they can, but they realize some students may not be able to do that. For example, we had 10 students from out of the country um, here um, when we closed and some of them are still here. They just they just couldn't get you know to their home country unfortunately for them. So at, at that point, they'll have to be there until student health reevaluates them and determines they're, they're able to go back to their original assignment. And at that point, they'll start to contract the contact tracing and reach out to those students. And the students that are um, who've been in contact with this individual will, will have to self quarantine in their location until they test positive. And then at that point, they'll move over to the quarantine, the mandatory quarantine. So that's how we're handling it today. Um, as we get to the next two weeks, we'll probably have more information about that. That's terrific, James. Thank you. Keith, did you want to add to that with an angle from the University of Houston? Certainly. I, I would say that our policy mirrors very much what um, Tom is doing um, at Jefferson. Um, we also have hired, um, I think, 12 contact tracers as cases um, develop on campus. We know they will, um, so that we have um, 
fall people that will be working on contact tracing throughout our, our campus um, for as long as we need them. That's perfect. That's really great because that is coming up and um, the fact that you have actually, are you utilizing students, Keith, for your contact rate and you've actually employed them, hired them? We, we are using students. Our, our College of Medicine is actually just opened, actually just opened this week um, and they put on some virtual training programs for actually this to Houston to um, get more contract tracers um, educated enough to, up to speed. Perfect. So that um, that takes me to a different question about drinking fountains. This does mm -hmm. come up um, a fair amount. People are struggling with drinking fountains. Mm -hmm. um, so Keith, I'll go with you since you were on at that point. Are you turning them off? Are you restricting them? Are you um, pointing to bottle filling stations or how are you handling the drinking fountain stuff? We have um, turned off all the water fountains on campus, um, but a number of our facilities do have um, touchless um, water filling stations. So those will be in operation. Good, similar. James, are you similar? Yes, very similar. Uh, the, the water fountains have all been de 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 deactivated and we will maintain the water filling stations. They're all touchless. Okay, perfect. Tom, I have a different question for you and it's about, um, in quarantined areas who will do so you've you've gone through that process you're now in this quarantine who will do the cleaning and disinfecting so in a quarantine area that's going to be our impact teams so they they'll clean with they're in full ppe um you know they'll go into those bathrooms they'll clean those bathrooms in full ppe um, they're trained for it um, they're gloved and tyvek from head to toe and uh, masks, of course, and goggles. Um, that's that's our intention. Okay, that's perfect. Others of you, are you? Uh, how are you thinking about handling this, uh, uh, Keith? And then I'll go to James. Uh, we have the same process in place that that Tom does again. So that's good to hear. Wow. <laughs> there you go. Okay, James. Reinforcing, yeah. <laughs> James. Yeah, I can't. I can't speak for the academic side of the house. I'm not exactly sure on that one here, but for the residential side of the house, um, our custodial staff right now is a level one going to address it in full PPE. But depending on what's going on, we may have the opportunity to use uh, SERPA, which is our contracted uh, vendor for, for those kinds of things. So it just depends on the level, but it, it, it first, the first thought is our custodial staff would be full PPE. Excellent. Hey, that's great. Um, so uh, there was a, a different question and, and yeah, I'm going to get into this. It's about any special plans that you have to address um, protests um, in particular to maintain campus health and safety. Are there plans that you have in place? This is a difficult one um, and, and yet important for us to at least share what our thinking is um, on this at the moment. Keith, I'll start with you if you're willing, and then James and Tom, because I think you're all having some experience with this. So Keith, then James, then Tom. Yeah, I, I would say that um, there's the, you know, the hard side and the soft side of this conversation. Um, the hard side is that we have a, a 10 person outdoor gathering requirement in Harris County, um, but we also have the soft side that this is a very difficult time for, um, uh, many members of our community and wanting to make sure that they're protesting, um, uh, you know, social injustice and racial injustice. So we don't have a hard and fast policy except for what we have in terms of COVID. Um, I think we're going to have to be um, flexible within reason, um, but but yet still um, make sure that social distancing is is occurring with masks and um, other um, health and safety um, standards. Perfect. Tom? And I would say that we're probably something very okay. similar. Oh, sorry. I would no. say we're doing something similar to what Keith is doing. Um, the only difference is the campus has a uh, limit on gathering 10 people less, not the county right now. Not, everything else is probably the same. Okay. Tom? So it's a dilemma. Um, Lander, you know, the Philadelphia down in our center city area was uh, 
you know, the victim of, of uh, a number of demonstrations in our proximity, never really against the university, but just uh, in the proximity and the, and the uh, streets and, and um, shops and so forth. And, uh, you know, we use the text alert systems with our, with our students, encourage them to, you know, to stay inside and, and alert them of where the concerns were. Uh, same thing with our staff and, and uh, our medical staff down there in, in our uh, faculty. But, uh, you know, the, there needs to be some venting. Uh, certainly, uh, we're hoping that it remains peaceful. We're not anticipating much of that at our East Falls campus. We've had a, you know, there may be some um, actions that if it's all student based and uh, there shouldn't be concern. If the if it starts to become, you know, intermingled with public or some of the other groups that are that are more um, uh, aggressive, uh, you know, our public safety will will work with the city of Philadelphia and, and likely turn turn the responsibilities over to the city of Philadelphia. Okay, very good. Uh, I think that's fair. Uh, there was a question about a system for contact tracing. If our folks do have um, any, um, Keith, you said you are hiring contact tracers. If you have a process that you might be willing to share um, afterwards, that would be really terrific. Um, and then also, I wanted to tell our participants that the University of Arizona does have a digital contact tracing platform that I am actually trying to get hold of. Um, and we'll seek to um, do some more work on that. And then also the July 24th town hall will address some of that. Um, so further information coming. Um, I, I had a specific question on elevators. How are we handling elevators in the residence halls? James? Yeah, sure. Um, we're, we're doing something very similar as most institutions. We will have quite a bit of signage there, but we're limiting it to either either two or four, depending on um, what the capacity is, they have to be social distancing, they have to wear the mask. So um, that's where we are. There'll be no more than four in any scenario. Got it, that's excellent, okay. Uh, Keith, how about you and, and I think in student uh, union, I saw your pictures, so you're gonna have elevators. What, what's your approach? We do, um, we're limiting the two, um, based on hopefully people following um, the immense amount of signage that's next to them and encouraging people to use the stairs. Oh, we're going to be healthy yet, aren't we? Yes, we will. <laughs> yes, we will. Um, uh, how about uh, the temporary lack of supplies? Um, I, I know that we've talked about wipe downs um, and self-service wipe downs, and people are worried about supplies capacity. Could you give them your thinking about supplies, uh, Keith, then James, then Tom? Keith, can you talk about that? From a departmental level, we certainly don't have the responsibility for the campus like Tom does. Um, but we have we we ordered a, a number of wipes and sanitizers from the beginning of um, our COVID experience, and we luckily enough got a, a pretty healthy stock of shipment in because we weren't probably hit as hard as um, the other parts of the country were. Um, so we have lots in in storage, um, but I don't know how long it's going to last. Okay, okay. Very good, and I think everybody, so what I'm going to do is my word, I've never seen so many questions and so many wonderful comments that people are making to one another as well. Um, we, will, um, we will go to close um, because I want to be conscious of the time. We've had a great set of um, panelists here. I thank them very much. They've done a wonderful job, and we have fielded more questions than ever before, so thank you. Um, the slide... Uh, next slide highlights our newest professional development offering, the Summer Series, found under the Continuous Learning Series tab on our website. Um, and the next slide notes our annual meeting. It's now called the Virtual Facility Summit, and we'd love to have you all um, participate in it, August 3 to 5. Registration is now live. Uh, we have a continued standing call for images. We do post those regularly, and they're just uh, wonderful coming from you. Uh, we have a slide showing other available resources, and of course, all of this is being recorded and sent to you. Um, a save the date for next Friday, July 17th topic is on special communities, the challenges and strategies for K-12 school districts, preparatory schools, community colleges, and possibly med ed. And then following Friday the 24th, we'll feature a return of our health professional, Dr. Michael Huey, 
on testing and tracing aerosolizing particles in the serology of the virus. Gandhi once said, and I am paraphrasing, your thoughts become your words. Your words become your behavior. Your behavior becomes your habits. Then might I suggest we all actively and routinely apply the simple but profound words of three-time Pulitzer Prize winning author and New York Times journalist Thomas Friedman. Respect science, respect nature, respect each other. Let those words transform your behavior into a meaningful and positive habit. Good day, everyone. Have a great weekend. We hope to see you next Friday. Thank you so much. Take care.